Okay, good mo good afternoon to to everyone. I'm uh, I want to apologize for not having exam two uh, in the regular mode. Uh, Uh, are you guys ready or what? You're talking over top. Uh, I, I uh, uh, had some medical treatments and I had to stay home. And I couldn't, I couldn't even come up, uh, they, the doctor made me stay home, so uh, my brain transplant prep, my prep for my brain transplant later this semester. Uh, anyways, uh, so uh, I apologize, I, I was hoping we could uh, do it the regular way, and uh, a lot less stress for everybody, but uh, you guys seem to have done all right. Uh, we're going to uh, talk about exam scores, uh, and then we're going to talk about chapter five and pretty much wrap chapter five uh, today, and then uh, dip forward. We're going to start hustling and bustling uh, through the concepts of heat and heat transfer, heat transport, et cetera, et cetera, uh, in the coming weeks. And uh, we're, we're aiming to understand molecules like DNA and uh, uh, water, that's a very simple molecule. And to do that, we, we need to um, have an idea of angular momentum, and that's what we're gonna be talking. We demonstrated it last, uh, two, well, two Tuesdays ago uh, with Darian and several of the students. And uh, we actually need that to understand what atoms do, because that ice skater effect uh, that we observed uh, with uh, Dior, I think you were doing the ice skater effect, and uh, one other student was doing uh, the uh, the angular momentum interchange, the flipping the bicycle wheel up and, and, and back. Uh, that actually is related to how atoms uh, behave, especially in chemical reactions. Now, you, you know, because we, we think of, uh, you know, uh, an atom, an electron circling and at, orbiting an atom in its orbital state, it's not a bicycle wheel, but it has some of the same spin properties that the bicycle wheel has. And it turns out that the full dynamical state of an atom uh, in itself and an atom trying to combine with another atom and form a compound uh, is related to or requires that you understand angular momentum. But before we get to that today, I want to talk about your exam score uh, situation. And it's fairly simple. We now have two exam scores for most of these on the books. And for that reason, we can now think about your um, grade state uh, the same way starting today as you'll think about it all the way to the end of the semester and up until the final. And the reason for that, we have one more midterm coming up in a couple weeks. And uh, uh, if you do better on that than you did on exam one or two, we'll trade that grade in and we'll keep it and we'll discard the lower of exam one or two, all right? But you'll still, if that applies to you, if exam three becomes your top grade on exams, you'll still, have, after exam three, you'll still have two exam grades on the books. But after exam three, it'll be your best two. Right now, 
it's your only two. All right? Yeah. Um, you uh, are uh, suggested, admonished, and in general, highly recommended to be here for exam three uh, so that you can crush it like a bug. Uh, cr wait a minute. Crush it like the Crimson Tide, our foes on the football field, and, uh, and have the luxury of keeping your best two out of three. Now, if you miss exam three, you're toast. And you got, you're stuck with whatever grades you have now. All right? Now, we, we, I'll do the grade for you, but, it, you know, my guess is that the most of you is your grades are going to be increasing. And the, I think the average is higher for exam two, and I'm guessing that the average will be higher for exam three, and that's usually the case. For many students, exam one is the, the exam that gets dropped. Now, some students it's not, but for many students it is. Right? Now, that, there won't be anything dropped if you miss exam three. But if you're here for exam three, you're in the catbird seat, as they say in baseball. Right? You're in a good position. We'll keep the best two out of three, and you will be very happy. Another thing that I want to mention to you, as I said, you can now think about your grade, your pointage, and everything. Uh, the same way now as you will all the way up to the final. Now, the final things will change. The big 100-point exam. But between now and, and final exam week, you have two exam scores, and then you have homework uh, pointage, and, you have, and we've done a lot of homework. And you have clicking pointage, participation pointage. Now, I've shown you how to do participation pointage. I haven't done a roundup lately, so I, maybe I'll do that this week. We're going to have some clicking in just a few minutes, so have your clicker handy. Uh, but um, you know how to figure out that part of your grade as well. The participation pointage, you have to use that proportion if you're below 85%. You'll always be able to tell from the grade book what? Why are you going like this? You tell me to shut up. No. Hush me up. The, the mic's too loud. I'll put the mic over here. All right. So, so uh, anyway, uh, you know how to calculate everything. Now, if you get a little nervous and you want to double check your grade status at any time, you just come to office hours and you know last three, four weeks of the semester, you know, we just go down like this and do these little tiny calculations and, uh, you know, just get the grades squared away. And I'll do it for you in office hours. No problemo. All right? I do it every year or every semester. So, But, I mean, you sh should be able to do it now. Uh, but if, you, if you're nervous, you know, that's good. Just come come check me in office hours. Uh... Also, uh, your I'm trying to think how to say this. Um, Uh, your attendance in every lecture is uh, voluntary. Your attendance at exams is mandatory, plus or minus one. You, know, you have one exam that will drop if you're here for that. Well, whether you're here or not, will drop one of your exam scores. Uh, but lectures is voluntary, so if if you miss a lecture, or if your clicker miss, you're here, but your clicker's in 
uh, Cleveland, Ohio, or something, which can happen. I know. Uh, you know, you're not, it's not going to be uh, too much skin off your nose. But you must remember this: homework and clicking together are the same size. How much do they? Add? Fifty points. They're the same together, those two things, and they're easy to get all those points. They're the same size as a midterm. So going into the last part of the semester now, you know, if you've got a lot of good points in homework and a lot of good points for clicking, and you maybe have one stinky midterm exam, which some of you, I mean, I'm not looking at anybody, but, you know, some of you have, but your homework and your clicking participation together are a nice chunk of change. And this semester, like I said, I at the end of the semester, this part of the semester, I'm always going over grades. Oh, Dr. B, am I going to pass this? You know, and they end up having a B when we calculate it out. You know, and it's because uh, many students do not. Uh, think about what they've got in the bank from clicking and from homework. And that is why I always say, if you want to have a decent grade, come to class, faithfully come to class, and faithfully do the homework, and you'll get a nice chunk of 50 points. You might not get 50, you might only get 49. But there's many students that bag all 50. And that has the same weight in your total semester grade as a midterm. So imagine getting a fifth, you know, raise your hand if you would like, well, I won't, don't raise your hand, but I mean, just think to yourself, if Dr. B asked who would like a 50 on the midterm, just think of all the hands that would go up if I asked for that. Everybody wants 50 on a midterm, 50 out of 50, all right? And that's what homework and participation together amount to or can amount to uh, for, for everybody in here who comes to class and has their clicker most of the time and uh, so on and so forth. All right. Now let me pause for questions. If you have anything that you would like to ask about grades, etc. All right, let's keep going. All right, we're going to talk about Chapter 5, Angular Momentum. And uh, this is, you know, you see these cool uh, time-lapse images. This one is from uh, the Southern Hemisphere, uh, one of the great observatories down at Paranal uh, in Chile, up in the high desert. And those star trails, what they've done, I don't know, that's about two hours exposure. Uh, so it looks like day you can see the, uh, the observatories and the trails of the star. And that's a sign that the Earth is spinning. And believe it or not, scientists have wondered about the, and Sir Isaac Newton and a lot of, and Albert Einstein, a lot of guys have wondered about what it means for the stars to be spinning relative to Earth and versus the Earth spinning relative to the stars. And uh, we're still thinking about that. It's because the theory of relativity um, takes into account uh, every motion of every object uh, and every bit of kinetic energy in the universe. And so that's a lot of kinetic energy uh, we th that we ca can think about. Uh, so let's talk about angular momentum. Now, let me draw your attention to page 64, uh, where we start talking about it. Here's this photo, a couple little shrimpy kids on the seesaw. Um, and But before we get down to the nitty-gritty, let's do a little uh, eye-clicker action here. I uh, want to see if your brains are uh, functioning or malfunctioning. I want to see if you're awake. If you're looking at your phone, 
or if you've got your clicker and ready to click. All right, here we go. Uh, question one, and, and read, uh, examine the diagram carefully for this one. And it's a pretty simple question. Which way does the seesaw spin? Read it carefully. Look at the diagram. Look at the specs. I think. Twenty seconds. Good. Ten. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Chick. All right. Um, okay. Uh, clockwise uh, is how that's going to go. And why is that? Because there's more mass. Uh, on this side. So that's the side that's going to go down. The other side is going to go up, and that's clockwise. All right, now, question number two. Read this one carefully. It is not the same. Fifteen seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Okay. Uh, and yeah, you guys did good on this one. Uh, I want you to add to your notes the word balance. This is a balance. I mean, it, we're styling it as a teeter-totter at the playground, right? But that's basically the same thing as a, as a balance that you would use for measuring masses. And this one you have mass 1, 40 kilograms, and mass 2 on the other side, uh, 40 kilograms. So now... The first uh, problem that we had is related to one that's in our textbook, this one. Uh, the son, uh, my son, this is Galileo now. My son defeats his little sister because he is heavier. Yeah, and, and what we say is the following. You know, here's the weight force. Uh, let me get my cursor over here. All right, here's the weight force of the sun. It's a bigger downward arrow than the weight force of the daughter. Ah, all right. So here's the. So go ahead and make a diagram. Uh, the distance from L to P is the same as the distance from R to P. So that's like two meters and two meters, from the clicker question. All right. But the weight of the son is more than the weight of the daughter. So he has a slightly bigger arrow downward. And what we say is that the son creates more torque. T-O-R-Q-U-E, about the pivot point, P. All right, now the daughter creates torque, and the daughter, in this diagram, she's creating um, clockwise torque, and the son is creating counterclockwise torque, all right, and he's creating more torque. So in this diagram, counterclockwise wins. All right, so make a note of that. Now we're going to talk about torque and how to calculate it. And it's kind of a fancy topic involving uh, it, that can involve a lot of trig. That's trigonometry. And we're not allowed to do trigonometry in here, uh, but we can do right triangles and stuff. That's fair game. Uh, so we're not going to get too deep into uh, torque and lever arm and stuff like that. 
but angles matter. So let's let's uh, get into this idea of torque uh, and leverage. You know this this famous story of Archimedes. You know Archimedes, the famous Greek mathematician. He, he actually lived in Italy, and uh, he said that if he could have a lever long enough, he, Archimedes, one man, could move the earth. And he's right. If you have a long enough lever, you can get a lot of leverage on things. And that's the idea of torque. And the idea of torque, the ability to spin something, not to move it from point A to point B in a straight line, but to spin it, and you know, and maybe staying in place. You I mean, you know, something that's spinning, it's not really changing the the position of its center of mass, but the spin might change, you know, increase or decrease or or even reverse. So the torque that you developed it depends on your position and how many newtons that you can either push or pull. So here's a you know a big old wrench, and everybody knows if you take a, a big wrench, you know. If if the if the uh, you, you know you're trying to unbolt something and you're working with a couple uh, wrenches, you know one going clockwise, the other one going anti anti-clockwise, uh, and if it does if you ain't getting it to budge, you get out the WD-40 or the or the solvent and try to uh, loosen up the bolts. But if that doesn't work, the other thing to do is you know as we used to. See, when I was in, when I was your guys' age, I was working at a Teflon factory part time, and uh, my boss Ernie, what a maniac! He said, "Get a bigger hammer." That was his, that was that was always his advice. If it ain't if it ain't working, get a bigger hammer. Or in this case, if it's not turning, if that bolt is not breaking loose, get a bigger wrench. And you know you can you can go out and see. You know, if we were living in Texas, and we were, and it was possible to go out to where they have oil uh, rigs, you know, derricks and you know, oil wells and stuff. Some of those guys have enormous wrenches for those big, um, you know, uh, oil wells. You know, the pipes are like, you know, very big around and stuff to get the oil out of the ground. Uh, so there's some ginormous wrenches, and you so you can, you know. And another thing, you know, you get a wrench, and if, if the wrench ain't long enough, get a pipe. And pipe, put that pipe on the wrench and just get at the end of the pipe and just give it a little. I see a lot of people going, yeah, I've done that. Yeah. Did you, ever, did you ever break a wrench? I've seen a guy do that and break the wrench in half. Well, you know, something like this. Only it was, it was a wrench this big, and he broke it. Unbelievable. Now, let's look at how this works. Go ahead and start making some sketches. Here's a door. And this, is a, this is a diagram from the textbook. And the hinge, it took pictures of a door. And the hinge is at point H. You know, so we're looking down from the top above the door. And if you push at the end furthest away from the hinge, in the direction of force F1, then you're going to get maximum torque. That's going to open the door most efficiently. But if you do it uh, like this guy down here uh, with force F2, in other words, pushing straight toward the hinge, nothing's going to happen. It's, it's not going to spin the door. So that's zero torque. All right? And that is an example of showing you where you are in relation to the the spin, the, the hinge, the pivot point, and where you, how far away you are, and actually the direction of the force that you apply, that all affects the torque that you can deliver. And so force number two here, zip zap, you're not getting any torque. You know, you could be uh, you could be the mighty Hulk and push it in that direction. 
Well, the Hulk is too smart for that. But I mean, somebody as big as the Mighty Hulk pushes that direction. That door ain't going nowhere. But a little teeny baby that pushes in the direction of F1, yeah, that door is going to open. All right, so the angle, and, and now, if you have an intermediate angle, you know, these are two basically, one of them's parallel to the door, one of them's perpendicular, right angles to the door. F1, go ahead and make a note of it. Force F1 is perpendicular, it's at right angles to the door, at least to this door. And force F2 is parallel to the door, it's pointing straight at the hinge, right? And if you have something like a 30 degree angle, you know, you got a little bit of, you've got some Newtons pointing toward the hinge and some Newtons pointing perpendicular to the door. You got a little mixture. Uh, that's where the trig comes in. So we're not going to mess around too much with that. It's basically a bunch of right triangles. Uh, it's not too bodacious, but we're not going to get too deep into that. But here's another thing that I want to point out to you. When you, um, when you push at this end of the door, you, the other thing that's true here is you're not pushing at the center of mass. So make a note of that. Force F1 and F2, they're not being exerted at the center of mass. Now, if you're on the football squad and you're in tackling practice, you know, they'll tell you, go for the... You know, we used to, they used to tell us, uh, go for the belt buckle, you know, on, on the other guy's uh, pant. You know, and you'll hit him right in the bread, the proverbial bread basket. And, and for humans, the uh, center of mass, for men and for women, it's, it's the same. It's right about the belly button. Did you know that? It's right about the belly. That's why your belly button is, is where it is. Because the center, of, when you're a little teeny baby in your mom's stomach, uh, that's the, the 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 most optimal place to attach the uh, what do they call it thing umbilical cord, center of mass. You know, and if you look at astronauts floating in space, you know they have um, you know lifeline with their oxygen and everything. Center of mass is where it goes. All right. So if you if you're trying to tackle somebody. And knock them on their keister, you go for the center of mass. I mean, you're supposed to. And you can't always do that in this, you know, because it's a fast game and everything like that. So sometimes you hit a guy low, sometimes you hit a guy high, but you, you know, you can tackle them either way. But you're supposed to go for the center of mass. For humans, it's the center. It's right at the belly button level, you know, and then in a few inches. All right. Now, for this door, it's pro if it's a if it's a normal door, it's right in the center between the the hinge point H and the end where the fingertip is. All right. Now, this guy is uh, force one and force two. They're not pushing um, at the center. Well, a actually, F one is not pushing at the center mass. He's applying. Well, his, his line of application is away from the center of mass. Now, F2, his line of application does go straight through the center of mass. Unfortunately, uh, it's the, the door is attached at the hinge, so it's not going to move in that direction. But if that thing were not, um, here's something to think about. Go ahead and skip down, new section of notes. Same door, but now we're out in space and there's no hinge. All right. Out in space. So you got a door out in space and there's no hinge. Now, force F1 is going to cause the door to spin and it's going to cause the door to move upward. Force F2, if there's no hinge and you're out in space, it will cause an acceleration, but no spin. Because it's going straight through the center of mass. So if you want to drive a guy straight back and, and not necessarily take him off his feet, you hit him at the center of mass. 
Okay, and that's what F2 is doing because the line of application goes straight through the center mass of the door. So he, does, he doesn't cause any spin, uh, but he does accelerate off to the right. And this one up here, uh, force F1, if it's out in space without a hinge, it will get a little bit of acceleration upwards and a little bit of spin at the same time. Now, that brings us to this concept of uh, momentum, and we need to do uh, add some vocabulary to our uh, description of momentum states. There's two different flavors of momentum. There's translational momentum and rotational or angular momentum. All right? And a translational momentum, that's like F2 applied in outer space. He's going to move straight from point A to point B. That's called, a, in math, uh, that's called a translation. Translation from point A to point B in a straight line. All right? Now, the momentum that we've studied heretofore uh, is translational momentum. Another word for it is linear momentum, momentum along a straight line. All right? The quantity of motion that Sir Isaac uh, Newton was talking about, uh, linear momentum or translational momentum. Translational momentum is a little bit more modern terms, a little bit fancier mathematics. Now, rotational momentum or angular momentum is, you know, independent of that. And there are fundamental, there's profoundly significant reasons that those two types of momentum are separate and independent of each other. So you can, you know, like force F1 out in space that I just mentioned a minute ago, it will cause translational motion upward. You'll get a little acceleration as long as you're applying that force upward. And you'll get a little bit of angular acceleration as well. And you'll change the spin state of that door if you're out of space. So rotational or angular momentum, uh, the object rotates about a fixed point. And every other point moves on a circle. All right. Now, for... Something out in space, the fixed point is the center of mass. The center of mass of the astronaut, the center of mass of this mythical door that we put out there. You know, anything out in space, you know, spacecraft. And that's why they have to have these, you know, these maneuvering rockets on a spacecraft. They have to be really, you know, very precise, because if they don't, you know, they can use them to get it, the, the uh, spacecraft to spin, and they can use it to make the spacecraft go in a certain direction. It can do translational or rotational, all right? And you can get a combination motion. It, in other words, it moves from point A to point B, and it spins as it goes. Now, that's what we would have got from the door with the application of force F1 in space. A little bit of spin and a little bit of upward acceleration. All right, so that's a combination. And, you, you know, here's another thing. If you... I'm trying to think. Oh, uh, do they at UCF football games, do they, do they bring a big UCF flag through? Like, does Nitro do that, or, or the cheerleaders? Does anybody? No? Yes? Yeah. Yeah, they do that? Yeah. Do they ever throw the flag into the air and then catch it? Have you ever, did you ever see him do that? Okay. Uh, all right. A lot of times you'll see uh, special uh, ROTC guys. All right. Sometimes the Marine Corps or the Army uh, or even the Navy will have a drill team 
and they march in formation, ultra precise. And one of the things that they do, you know, as an exhibition, is they toss their uh, rifle in the air and then, you know, and then catch it when it comes back down. Stuff. And so that's an example of, you know, that thing going end over end. There's another example of football. All right. You know, you kick a football and it goes end over end. Um, and that's because you hit it, you kick the football with your foot towards one end of the football. So one end of the football goes forward and the other one starts going backwards and, and you get that, that backspin on the football. A punter in the football field will try to hold it differently. The punter will hold it differently and he'll try to impart a spin along uh, an axis through the, the long axis of the football. All right? And if he shanks it, it's going to be a wobbler or an end over end. It won't go. But if you get a spin on the football, just like a quarterback throwing the football, you know, a good quarterback will put a good spin on it. That stabilizes it, helps it go further and more accurately through the air. And a punter will do the same thing. A punter doesn't want – normally – the punter does not want to get end over end, although sometimes they want that. Usually they want to get a good spiral up in the air and all the way back down again, and by that time the team's down there to tackle the guy. All right? So, uh, so end over end football, that's a combination motion. It's moving from point A to point B, and it's spinning as it goes. So that's what we got here. All right, now let's take a look at angular momentum space uh, states. And we'll start with torque. The rotational analog of F equals MA is this. Tau, Greek letter tau equals capital I times alpha. Okay, now tau is the symbol for torque for us. Now some books have different symbols for torque. But that's a lowercase Greek letter tau. And then capital I, that's the moment of inertia, and that is the rotational analog of mass. And then alpha is the angular acceleration. So, so many degrees per second per second for alpha. So write that down, alpha, angular acceleration, you know, a number of degrees per second or so many revolutions per minute per per second, you know. So if you're if you're if your uh, bicycle wheel speeding up, you go from 10 RPM to 30 RPM. All right, and that's an acceleration. That's a delta. Uh, that's like a delta V, but a rotational delta V. All right. So you always have to identify the axis or the axle if it's a solid object. Um, and then, you know, the spin rate about that axis. And the interesting thing is, this thing is in motion. Every part of this disk is in motion. But it's not really changing its position. Each object, each little pixel of this disk is changing its position, but it never gets any further away from the axis. You know, if it's a, if it's a good circular uh uh, disk, right? And it's going at a certain speed, like 600 RPM or some other speed. Now, here's Newton's second law. F net equals delta P over delta T. And the uh, that's the, the law uh, by which momentum states are changed. You know, the, you know, that's like the impulse formula. F delta T equals delta P, all right? Now, the corresponding law for rotational motion is this. Tau equals delta something over delta t. So the question is, all right, if these are really analogous, um, what's the rotational analog of momentum? I mean, because like up here in Newton's second law, delta p up there in the numerator, yeah, okay, that's good. We know about you know, p equals mv and all that stuff. What what is it? What what's the numerator over here for the rotational analog of that? 
And the answer to that is angular momentum. Delta angular momentum goes up there in that one. So there are two kinds of angular momentum, and we've already alluded to them. The first kind is orbital angular momentum. In other words, an object on a curved path, or any kind of path really, past or around a certain central point or relative to a certain axis. Now this one here, every little pixel of this disk is going on a circular orbit around the axle. Right? The other kind of angular momentum is spin angular momentum. And it's basically just uh, the sum of a lot of orbital angular momentums for a solid object. So, so we, we would normally say the angular momentum state of this disk is basically its spin angular momentum. Versus, and, and here's another way to think about it, another example. The Earth orbits the sun once every year. That is orbital, that is because it has orbital angular momentum. The Earth spins on its axis once per day. And that is because it also has spin angular momentum. The spin angular momentum and the orbital angular momentum of the moon are synchronized. And that, and that is because of gravity, the effect of gravity. So the same face of the moon always faces Earth. You know, we think of the far side of the moon, we've, we, we can't see it from Earth because only the near side of the moon is facing us. Right? And when it's a half moon, it's not that we're seeing half the, the front and half of the back. The half of the front is shaded in, at night and, and half of it's lit up. So it's the same side. So the angular momentum, the spin and the orbital are distinct and in the case of the moon, they're exactly synchronized. Now, Earth and Sun, um, the spin of the Earth and the orbit of the Earth, they're not synchronized. But for the moon, yes. Now, let's talk a little bit more about orbital angular momentum. So you have to have some fixed point of interest, some, you know, where the axis, the, the orbital axis is. Now, for the solar system, that's the SUN. So let me draw a picture of the SUN. So this green blob down the lower right, did you know that the, the color of the sun is green, the brightest color in the spectrum of the sun? Rainbow, the, the, light, the, 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 light, the colors of a rainbow, the brightest is green. So the sun is actually a green star. It's kind of cool when you think about it. All right, so there's the Earth, and the Earth's on an orbit. It's pretty close to circular. But, you know, there's other stuff. Here's a, here's a comet. And comets have angular momentum. And usually a comet will have a bigger um, eccentricity. They'll have a very oval, elliptical orbit. But, you know, theoretically, a circle is a form of an ellipse. It's a, it's a completely symmetric ellipse without eccentricity. But comets are usually on eccentric orbits like this. All right? So the distance and the angle from the point where your object is to the center of the sun, um, that's what you use to calculate the angular momentum. And also, we can think about the angular momentum of an electron orbiting a nucleus. All right now. We, we used to think, you know, a hundred years ago that the electrons were like little planets orbiting the nucleus. Now we know that in quantum mechanics, uh, we think of the electron as being something else. But uh, it's, still, it's still handy to think about it sometimes. So the distance and the angle, so a little bit of trick, and also the velocity, all right, and... The basic formula, so here's the velocity arrow, 
for the Earth down here. All right. So if you know the distance and you know the velocity and if you know the mass of the object, you can figure out the orbital angular momentum. Now here's the formula for it. It's nothing, and this is for a circular orbit. L equals m r v, and at capital L is the customary symbol, but not the only one. It's a very common symbol for angular momentum. For linear momentum, translational momentum, we tend to use the symbol p, but for angular momentum, we tend to use the symbol capital L. And in atomic physics, the orbital angular momentum of the electron, we use the symbol uh, little l, lowercase l. Yeah, MRV. The radius from the center of the sun out to the center of Earth. All right. Now, let me add a little bit of a enrichment on an elliptical orbit this same formula is exact at two different places all the way out here at aphelion farthest place from the sun but only there and then all the way down here at perihelion the nearest place to the sun. And the reason for that is, at those two places, the radius and the velocity are perpendicular. So if you're on an elliptical orbit, like right here, this intermediate point, the radius uh, from Earth to, to the comet, or from the sun to the comet, and its velocity, they're not perpendicular. So at that point, you got to use a lot of trig and stuff. But at this point out here, furthest point, and this point in here, closest point, yep, L equals MRV in both places. And what that should tell you, oh, there's one more thing. And I'll add this as a side note um, of profound significance. Gravitational attraction, Newton's law of gravitation, is only directed from it's a it's a centripetal force from one towards the other there's no sideways perpendicular force it's always center to center it's a centripetal force and for that reason angular momentum is conserved let me repeat that newton's law of gravity his law of universal gravitation the gravitational force is centripetal, from center of mass to center of mass, straight, straight along the radius from one object to the other. And because that is true, angular momentum is conserved. And that is why if you measure the velocity, Dior, at the farthest point, It'll be really small because R is big out there. But if you measure the velocity down here at the closest point, R is small, so V is going to be really big. And that's, that's consistent with the fact that gravity is stronger down there. All right? Now, at those two points on an elliptical orbit, it's easy to use this formula. Uh, so it's just a nice little side note. L equals MRV is true at every point on a circular orbit. But any elliptical orbit, it's true on those two points, the furthest point out and the closest point. So it's kind of nice. Now let's keep going and talk about spin angular momentum. All right, so here's my solid object, a disk. Uh, so you can think of this as like a wheel on your car or something like that. And basically, the spin angular momentum is the sum of a bunch of orbital angular momentums, a lot of L equals MRVs, for each little pixel. All right? And so they're, it's, if it's a rigid object, they're all going to have the same period of making a revolution. 
you know, so the, you know, at the edge of the disk, those will be moving faster because they cover more per second, more centimeters per second. Uh, and stuff down here close to the axle, they're they're uh, they're making one revolution in the same amount of time, but those are they're traveling a smaller circle down there, right? But they're all in the same angular frequency. And so the formula for the um, the angular momentum is related to the angular velocity. This one's a little bit closer to uh, the uh, the linear momentum definition, P equals mv. For this one, capital I is the moment of inertia, and I'll show you how to calculate that in a minute. Um, and that's the rotational analog of mass. That's related to the ice skater effect. And lowercase omega, it's kind of a curvaceous W. Okay, That's the lowercase Greek letter omega. That stands for the angular speed. You know, So that could be like 43 RPM or 2200 degrees per minute or you know 50 degrees per second or you know something like that all right 600 RPM there's your angular velocity for this thing spinning all right and so that formula L equals IW is particularly uh, simple but we don't know you know we can study electrons and how they combine in, in chemical uh, compounds and stuff. And we found that the electrons have a spin angular, an intrinsic spin. But we don't, you know, we don't really understand where that intrinsic spin comes from because we've never figured out that there's a radius of an electron. Electron, never, we've never actually found the size of electron. Every time we think about it, try to measure it, it's always smaller than anything that we can measure. So we, you know, we just don't know why electrons have intrinsic angular momentum. It's one of those mysteries of the universe. You know, and not even Stephen Hawking, not even Albert Einstein could figure that one out. There's a lot of stuff we still don't know. So, you know, the stuff you guys are learning, you may think, well, this, everybody knows all this stuff, all the you know, the geniuses like Einstein and stuff. No, they don't. There's a lot of stuff they don't know and would like to know. And this is one of them. Nobody knows the answer to that. There's a lot of stuff like that. Here's something else that's kind of interesting. Photons. A photon of light has intrinsic angular momentum. Riddle me that one, Batman. That's a profound mystery. Photons are the most mysterious of them all. Electrons, they're pretty cool too, but photons, oh my goodness. Very, very uh, unusual. Now, let's keep going here. Uh, let's go past that. Okay, every point on a rotating body has the same angular velocity. Two points on the object at different, dif dif different distances from the axis rotate with different speeds. So the miles per hour rating for something near the center is smaller than the miles per hour, the speedometer rating, for something out by the edge. Um, so just, you know, I've already mentioned that several times, and this is a diagram for it. Now, I want to draw your attention to YouTube. Uh, just to tell you that in YouTube, uh, you will see Darian and a bunch of other uh, humanoids uh, in the section called angular momentum. Now we already uh, looked at it in lecture and we've videotaped a bunch of them from past semesters and you guys can look at that uh, as well if you if you feel like it. All right now let's get back to this idea of torque. Um, an extended object. This is now, here's, here's my two forces again, F1 and F2. Now, these are different. All right? They're both acting perpendicular to this piece of wood floating out in the lake. All right? But one of them, F1, is pointing straight through the center of mass, point C. 
F2 is off to the side by a distance D, all right? Now, um, baseballs and stuff, we think about as point, obje as point objects, you know, that, you know, because the center of mass of a spherical thing like a baseball is a geometric point. But um, a real object like a board or something like this will take a very complex trajectory uh, that depends on F equals MA and also on torque. All right, so make a note of that. And I'm going to show you a couple images that I just want you to look at. All right, make a note that we have some complex trajectories coming up. Because the, the, as, as I say, the place where you apply the force, if you're going to move this board on the surface of the water, if you push it through point C, it's going to just move off without spinning. But if you push it at point F2, it'll move off and it will spin. All right. Now, here's an example of that. All right. Now, I want you to look at this carefully. All right. This is a strobe photo. And this is a wrench. Now, it's completely irregular shape. There is a center of mass to it. And if you look carefully, you'll see, like right here, it's pretty clear, there's a black X painted on that wrench at its center of mass, all right? And notice that this thing is moving. It's either moving left or moving right, but it's, uh, dear, uh, no, if you look at that, look at it carefully. Yo, in the back, look at it. Don't look at your computer, look at this. All right. Look at those X's. Look at those black X's. Yo, over there by the wall. Look at those black X's. Come on. Look at that stuff. You're learning something here through your eyes, not through me blazing my mouth. They're all on the same level. They're all level. You could put a ruler through it. Matter of fact, I put a, a row of diamonds here. Look at these diamonds. They're all straight across. Now I'm going to move them down. All right. Let me do that again. Here's my diamonds. Look at that. And those di those are they form a nice straight line, right? You can see that. Now they're going to cover up those pluses. See that? And so this is a this is a trajectory of something that got it got pushed. Actually, you know, this would be a good test question. Was this thing pushed through its center of mass or through a point not at the center of mass? And in matter of fact, where was it pushed? Was it pushed down here? Was it pushed at the center of mass? Or was it pushed up here by the, uh, by the opening? If it's moving in this direction, you can tell it was pushed somewhere down here because it's spinning. It wasn't pushed at the center of mass. It was pushed somewhere off to the side. Here's another one. Check this guy out. All right. This is a, a guy that is a lot braver than me. Jumping a... Yeah, look at it. You see it? Come on, don't look at your computer. Look at this. It's a motorcyclist. He's making a jump. Now look, there's the baseball arc. I mean, if you threw a baseball, it would just follow that arc. And that's what his center of mass is doing. But you know what else? He's, he's doing a flip on a motorcycle. Oh, my goodness. So parabolic arc, just like a baseball, but because he's an extended object and he, and he launches just right, uh, he can do a flip like that. I'm happy to see it, but I would never want to do that. Now, let's calculate moment of inertia. The moment of inertia, this is the basic formula for it. And we're going to do a simple calculation. So add this to your notes. 
you know, the, the spin angular momentum is simply I times the angular velocity. All right, so I'm going to show you how to calculate I. So what you do is you take your object and pixelate it and calculate the M times the distance R squared for each pixel and then add them all up. All right. So, uh, so you can do it here. You know, the, the, these two dumbbells, and I, I discuss it in the textbook. You know, one of them 45 centimeters. That's about, you know, maybe this big across. And the other one's 60 centimeters, you know, another third bigger. All right. And so the R's are different, but if they're the same size dumbbells, uh, then the mass, the, the, each pixel of mass, you know, each cubic centimeter of mass, for instance, is going to have the same mass, right? But you're going to have different R squares. So you calculate up R squared for each one, and then you add them all together. Now, if you're in calculus class, you do it using uh, calculus. Uh, so we're not going to do any fancy ones, but we are going to use, so write down that formula, I equals the sum, that's a Greek letter sigma, that stands for sum. Kind of like Greek letter delta stands for difference. Greek letter sigma, S, sum. The sum of all the pixels, M R squared for each one, you know, so pick a pixel, calculate M, calculate R, measure R, measure M, calculate R squared, multiply them together, and add it up, and, and just do it for each pixel. All right? Now, I equals sum of M R squared. Now, here we go. Let's do this calculation together. All right? Simple moment of inertia. So we're going to do two pixels. All right? A 7 kilogram and a 7 is pretty big pixels. All right? And we're going to ignore the bar. All right? So the bar uh, connecting these two, we're going to assume that to be massless. You know, so this is kind of an idealized view. So one pixel on the left, 7 kilograms. And one on the right, seven kilograms. And let's say that from center to center is 4.20 meters. All right. So that's like uh, that's like from me over to this other chair past Darien. All right. So that's about 4.2 meters. All right, so seven kilograms here, seven kilograms over there. Now we're gonna we have to identify an axis, so we're gonna use the easiest one there is, the symmetry axis. All right, so go ahead and, and we're gonna calculate m r squared and the moment of inertia about this axis. Now if we had, you know, if it was a door. The axis that we would choose would be at one end, all right? But this one we're doing, you know, and if you're working out, you usually grab that, you know, you're doing curls, biceps curls or triceps curls. You grab it, you know, in the center if you, if you know what you're doing. If you don't know what you're doing, you can grab it somewhere else. Anyways, you grab it in the center, and that's what we're going to do, all right? So that being the case... Uh, we got 2.10 meters left and 2.10 meters right. So those are the two R's. So remember, we're doing MR squared for each of these pixels. We got two pixels. We have M for each, and now I have R for each. If I chose a different axis, I'd have a different pair of numbers, but I did this one so it'd be fairly basic to calculate and realistic. This is a real calculation. <coughs> You know, I'm sure there's engineers around that are de designing machines and that have a calculation of moment of inertia just like this. Fairly big machine. All right, here we go. Let's do the calculation. All right, here it is. Okay. Now, the first line in my equation block, I have a sum over two masses, two pixels, uh, of mR squared for each one. Right now, what that means is, on the second one, second line of my equation block, I have the mass of the first pixel times the distance between that pixel and the rotation axis, and then quantity squared. So this is 2.10 meters 
and it's being squared. Right? Now my other pixel in this idealized example is exactly the same. So this is like dittos over here. And if you have something, you know, symmetric, it's you know, like a bicycle wheel, you basically do one pair and then just do ditto for as many pairs as you need to do around the bicycle wheel. Anyway, so we got two here. And in your textbook, you have another example, a couple examples, I think. So 7 kilograms times 2.10 meters quantity square. All right, so that's the sum. That's what this thing means, All right? This fancy-looking formula with a Greek capital sigma of mr squareds for the two masses, here it is. M r squared, m r squared for the two masses. All right, let's calculate 2.1 quantity squared. Uh, anybody verify me on that? 4.41? You got it? Okay. okay so 4.41, then multiply that by 7, and you get 30.87, And but you still have to add to those two together, all right? Right, so you got 30.87, and notice, you guys, the units here. Kilogram meter squared. Write that down. Make sure you get that part. Because when you square R, MR squared, you're squaring a meter. So that means you've got meter squared in your final result. Right now you just got to add them together. Ching, 61.74 kilogram meter squared. And that is the moment of inertia for this big uh, barbell. All right. That would be a pretty good lift. Pretty good for uh, biceps curls. All right. Now, I have a special announcement before we dismiss. Because we're just getting back from spring break, and also because we don't have another spring break next week, unfortunately, uh, I'm not giving you guys any homework tonight. Right, so I'll see you Thursday. You're dismissed. Unfortunately, We are to the end of the semester, Dr. Lee. Really close. It's terrifying. Where's my cursor? Here it is.